This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot org. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 35 in which Phileas Fogg does not have to repeat his orders to Passepartout twice. The dwellers in Savile Row would have been surprised the next day if they had been told that Phileas Fogg had returned home. His doors and windows were still closed. No appearance of change was visible. After leaving the station, Mr. Fogg gave Pispartu instructions to purchase some provisions and quality went to his domicile. He bore his misfortune with his habitual tranquillity, ruined, and by the blundering of the detective, after having steadily traversed the long journey, overcome a hundred obstacles, braved many dangers, and still found time to do some good on his way, to fell near the goal by a sudden event which he could not have foreseen, and against which he was unarmed. It was terrible, but a few pounds were left of the large sum he had carried with him. There only remained of his fortune the twenty thousand pounds deposited at bearings and this amount he owed to his friends of the reform club so great had been the expense of his tour that even had he won it would not have enriched him and it is probable that he had not sought to enrich himself being a man who rather laid wages for honor's sake than for the stake proposed. But this wager totally ruined him. Mr. Fogg's course, however, was fully decided upon. He knew what remained for him to do. A room in the house in Savile Row was set apart for Iota, who was overwhelmed with grief at her protector's misfortune. From the words which Mr. Fogg dropped, she saw that he was meditating some serious project. Knowing that Englishmen, governed by a fixed idea, sometimes resort to the desperate expedient of suicide, this part two kept a narrow watch upon his master, though he carefully concealed the appearance of so doing. First of all, the worthy fellow had gone up to his room, and had extinguished the gas burner, which had been burning for eighty days. He had found in the letter-box a bill from the gas company, and he thought it more than time to put a stop to this expense, which he had been doomed to bear. The night passed, Mr. Fogg to bed. But did he sleep? Hilda did not once close her eyes. Bispartu watched all night like a faithful dog at his master's door. Mr. Fogg called him in the morning and told him to get Aota's breakfast and a cup of tea and a chop for himself. He desired Aota's to excuse him from breakfast and dinner, as his time would be absorbed all day in putting his affairs to rights. In the evening he would ask the permission to have a few moments conversation with the young lady. Passepartout, having received his own orders, had nothing to do but obey them. He looked at his imperturbable master, and could scarcely bring his mind to leave him. His heart was full, and his conscience torture by remorse, for he accused himself more bitterly 
than ever of being the cause of the irretrievable disaster. Yes, if he had warned Mr. Fogg and had betrayed Fix's projects to him, his master would certainly not have given the detective passage to Liverpool, and then Passepartout could hold in no longer. My master, Mr. Fogg, cried he, why do you not curse me? It was my fault that... I blame no one, returned Mr. Fogg, with perfect calmness. Go! Passepartout left the room and went to find Aota, to whom he delivered his master's message. Madame, he added, I can do nothing myself, nothing. I have no influence over my master, but you, perhaps... What influence could I have? replied Aota. Mr. Fogg is influenced by no one. Has he ever understood that my gratitude to him is overflowing? Has he ever read my heart? My friend, he must not be left alone an instant. You say he is going to speak with me this evening? Yes, madame, properly to arrange for your protection and comfort in England. We shall see, replied Aota, becoming suddenly pensive. Throughout the day, Sunday, the house in Savile Row was as if uninhabitable, and Phileas Fogg, for the first time since he had lived in that house, did not set out for his club when Westimer clock struck half past eleven. Why should he present himself at the reform? His friends no longer expected him there. As Phileas Fogg had not appeared in the saloon on the evening before Saturday, the 21st of December, at a quarter before nine, he had lost his wager. It was not even necessary that he should go to his bankers for the twenty thousand pounds, for his antagonists already had his check in their hands, and they had only to fill it out and send it to the bearings to have the amount transferred to their credit. Mr. Fogg, therefore, had no reason for going out, and so he remained at home. He shut himself up in his room and busied himself putting his affairs in order. His part two continually ascended and descended the stairs. The hours were long for him. He listened at his master's door, and looked through the keyhole, as if he had a perfect right to do so, and as if he feared that something terrible might happen at any moment. Sometimes he thought of Fix, but no longer in anger. Fix, like all the world, had been mistaken in Phileas Fogg, and had only done his duty in tracking and arresting him while he was part two, this thought haunted him, and he never ceased cursing his miserable folly. Finding himself too wretched to remain alone, he knocked at Aota's door, went into her room, seated himself without speaking in a corner, and looked ruefully at the young woman. Aota was still pensive, about half past seven in the evening, Mr. Fogg sent to know if Aota would receive him, and in a few moments he found himself alone with her. Phileas Fogg took a chair and sat down near the fireplace, opposite Aota. No emotion was visible on his face. Fogg returned was exactly the Fogg who had gone away. There was the same calm, the same impassibility. He sat several minutes without speaking, then, bending his eyes on Aota, Madame, said he, will you pardon me for bringing you to England? I am Mr. Fogg, replied Aota, checking the pulsation of her heart. Please let me finish, retorted Mr. Fogg. When I decided to bring you far away from the country, which was so unsafe for you, I was rich. 
and I counted on putting a portion of my fortune at your disposal. Then your existence would have been free and happy, but now I am ruined. I know it, Mr. Fogg, replied Aota, and I ask you in my turn, will you forgive me for having followed you, and, who knows, for having perhaps delayed you, and thus contributed to your ruin? Madame, you could not remain in India, and your safety could only be assured by bringing you to such a distance that your persecutors could not take you. So, Mr. Fogg, resumed Aota, not too content with rescuing me from a terrible death, you thought yourself bound to secure my comfort in a foreign land? Yes, madame, but circumstances have been against me. Still, I beg to place the little I have left at your service. But what will become of you, Mr. Fogg? As for me, madame, replied the gentleman coldly, I have need of nothing. But how do you look upon the fate, sir, which awaits you? as I am in the habit of doing. At least, said Iota, want should not overtake a man like you. Your friends? I have no friends, madame. Your relatives? I have no longer any relatives. I pity you, then, Mr. Fogg, for solitude is a sad thing, which no heart to which to confide your griefs. They say, perhaps, that misery itself, shared by two sympathetic souls, may be borne with patience. They say so, madame. Mr. Fogg, Sayota, rising and seizing his hand, do you wish at once a kinsman and friend? Will you have me for your wife? Mr. Fogg at this rose in turn. There was an unwanted light in his eyes, and slight trembling of his lips. Aota looked into his face. The sincerity, rectitude, firmness, and sweetness of this soft glance of a noble woman who could dare all to save him to whom she owed all at first astonished then penetrated him he shut his eyes for an instant as if to avoid her look when he opened them again i love you he said simply yes by all that is holiest i love you and i am entirely yours ah cried Aota, pressing his hand to her heart. Pushpartu was summoned and appeared immediately. Mr. Fogg still held Aota's hand in his own. Pushpartu understood, and his big, round face became as radiant as the tropical sun at its zenith. Mr. Fogg asked him if it was not too late to notify the Reverend Samuel Wilson of Mary Laban Parish that evening. Pispartu smiled, his most genial smile, and said, Never too late. It was five minutes past eight. Will it be for tomorrow Monday? For tomorrow Monday, said Mr. Fogg, turning to Aota. Yes, for tomorrow Monday, she replied. Pispartu hurried off as fast as his legs could carry him. End of chapter 35 this has been a TBL3 production.